So Children's Hospital Traunstein is an academic teaching hospital of Ludwig Maximilians University Munich and is a tertiary care pediatric hospital which serves the entire population in the area from neonatal to adolescents, uh, premature babies and intensive care. And we're located uh, between Munich and Salzburg, uh, near the, on the foot of the mountains of the Alps and near the Chiemsee. We have added plenty of pediatric subspecialties. Uh, we have uh, now fellows in neonatal medicine, in uh, pediatrics, uh, residents, we have ICU fellows and we have fellows in cardiology. We've also added subspecialties like pediatric neurology, pediatric diabetes, gastroenterology, pediatric nephrology, and we cooperate closely with the pediatric surgeons at this hospital. There is plenty of data in the literature that using a specialty transport team for children improves outcome. Transporting neonates or even preterm infants from one hospital to a specialized center implies many problems. These babies are sensitive and at a high risk for complications. To create a good environment for transporting these patients is a big challenge. Why do we need neonatal transport? Our goal should be to transport these neonates to special risk to a specialized unit before birth. So the best incubator is the mother. And in developed countries, this goal is reached for many patients. So need for transportation is becoming less frequent. But there are a lot of reasons why such a transport in utero not always is possible. Sometimes the time is too short or the distance is too long. The risk could not be detected before birth or the neonate develops unexpected problems after birth. Despite this, we have in different countries very different situations. There has been done an investigation in Ireland where they have around 300 transports a year. Most of them are ground transports. And most of these babies were transported in the first two days of their lives or in the first week. So lots of patients transported are newborns. And over the half of these patients were preterm infants. And the other point is that the most of these transports were completed after scheduled service hours. So you have to deal with preterm infants and you have to be on call all night, all day. In the United States, we have another very different situation. There has been done a big investigation two years ago where they just looked around the country and there are around 400 different transport services and the structure is very inhomogeneous. Some of these transport services do only 50 transports per year, others over 1,000. The United States are a very big country, so the transports in air are a lot. In helicopter, around 50% and fixed-wing air transports are also around 30-40%. So the most transports in the United States are over long distance and in the air. Another country where they did an investigation two years ago was Brasilia and a very different situation. And they uh, investigated only transport of preterm infants. And the mean distance was there around 90 kilometers. And in Brasilia, there are only in one-third of the cases accompanied by a pediatrician. And also the equipment is not to compare with the equipment we can use. They had only in 57% an incubator available, very rare infusion pump or oximeters or something like this. So as we see, there are big differences in the different countries. Here in Germany we have around 15,000 transports every year and also in Germany we have different regions and in these regions the structure is not similar and in Bavaria we have around 1,400 transports every year but the distances are not so long. We have a lot of units that are able to transport babies. The logistics are very important and the key point is 
that we have to have good collaboration between the obstetric department and the neonatologists. And there have to be plans how it could be managed if a baby comes, uh, comes in problems and in trouble and uh, the structure should be defined. <clears throat> Another point is that you have to be available seven days, 24 hours and it should be a specialized neonatal transport team and you should have a good equipment. In our hospital is it like this. Usually we have an ambulance vehicle and that is picking up the incubator and the team here in Traunstein and the ambulance is transporting the team and the incubator to the hospital where the baby was born. In very urgent situations we use the helicopter. The team is carried by helicopter to the hospital and the incubator is being brought by the ambulance. Let's focus on the team. Also here we have big differences in the, in the different countries. In the United States the team consists most frequently of a registered nurse and a respiratory therapist. Uh, it's very rare that phys physicians are part of the team, only around 6% and the neonatologist is only in around 2% uh, part of the team. In Germany it's usually like this, it's always a physician that is specially trained and a specialized nurse. Ich bin glücklich, ein Team zu haben, das gut zusammenhält, das auch in schwierigen Situationen ähm, den Mut nicht verliert, das miteinander kommunizieren kann, das ähm, gut geschult in den letzten Jahren in Reanimationstrainings ähm, sehr weitergebildet wurde. We do uh, somewhere in the magnitude of uh, two to 300 transports per year. And uh, it's normally divided into air and ground transports. So we have the uh, possibility to send the helicopter, or sometimes referred to as rotor wing, or we can send the team by ground. There's been one study in pediatrics a couple of years ago where it's been shown that if you compare a specialty pediatric transport team versus a non-specialty team, a non-specialty team would be either a, a team of firefighters or paramedics that are not uh, trained in spe uh, specialty in pediatrics, that the specialty pediatric dreams had a much better outcome. And that was measured because they had much less unexpected events. And an unexpected event is, for example, on transport, the loss of an endotracheal tube, the loss of an IV, sudden hypotension, or a sudden a shock or other outcomes. So the specialty teams had a better outcome from that regard. Also here we had investigations of the United States and uh, around 80% of the transports, um, they transported only neonatal patients. Around 30% were transports of both neonatal and pediatric patients, so there's also a big specialization in the United States. What kind of patients do we have? I already mentioned the preterm infants. These are very special, very sensitive patients. More often we see neonates with respiratory problems or with infections or even with uh, congenital malformations that were not detected before birth. Die besondere Herausforderung beim neonatologischen Transport ist, ähm, dass man nie genau weiß, was einen erwartet. Ähm, es wird der Notfall abgesetzt von der betreffenden Klinik und uns durch die Leitstelle übermittelt. Ähm, in der Regel wird äh, die Situation vor Ort schlimmer geschildert, als sie dann wirklich ist. Man muss sich aber darauf einstellen, dass man ein sehr schlechtes und ähm, sehr intensiv pflegeaufwendiges Kind antrifft. It's important to recognize that the patients that we transport between facilities can be quite ill. And often the sending facilities have already initiated things like high frequency ventilation or inhaled nitric oxide to stabilize the baby before he gets transported to the uh, tertiary care NICU, such as ours. 
And with that come certain logistic problems. We recognize that once a baby is escalated on inhaled nitric oxide and high frequency ventilation, the transport team doesn't really have much room to maneuver and they can't really discontinue those treatments. And so we sometimes have to utilize inhaled nitric oxide for transport. When INO is used, it's uh, very well approved for the, uh, for the use in babies who are hypoxemic or in babies who have pulmonary hypertension. But I think it's important to train the transport team not only to monitor the response to ni nitric oxide, but also to monitor worsening among nitric oxide. Because some patients who are cyanotic and look they, like they have a pulmonary disease may actually have a cardiac disease, and certain cardiac diseases may worsen once inhaled nitric oxide is used. And that would be, for example, a lesion where there is ductal dependent systemic circulation, which means that the baby shunts right to left on the ductus on the level of the, of the ductus arteriosus, and uh, that baby needs to pull blood from the pulmonary circulation to provide systemic uh, output. And that would be, for example, a baby with critical aortic stenosis. And if we don't recognize that and give nitric oxide to that baby, the baby may have lower pulmonary vascular resistance and the PVR pressures may go down and hence he may have less pressure to perfuse the systemic circulation. So those are the kind of patients that actually may worsen under nitric oxide. So we have to be careful to uh, instruct the transport teams that not every patient may benefit, but also pa some patients may deteriorate and when to stop that therapy. The other uh, interesting issue is high frequency ventilation. We do encourage that sending facilities uh, communicate with us early um, for the referral because we recognize that there is a certain window of opportunity that we have to bring a neonate from a sending facility to a tertiary care NICU. And that window of opportunity is usually when the baby is escalated on settings, but is not on maximal settings. Once the baby is on full settings, is on high frequency ventilation, we often, that's something we cannot provide on transport easily. So we have to transition the baby back to conventional ventilation, and that may be difficult. So that's where really communication comes into play. And uh, we would like to hear about these babies as early as possible and really establish a communication, call me back tomorrow, see how the baby's doing, and not wait until the last minute because then the baby may be so escalated on support that it may be actually hard to put him in the helicopter. We have requirements, we need a good equipment. And what are the goals of this equipment? First is we want to prevent loss of warmth, so we need an incubator that offers a good access to the neonate and offers also good possibilities to regulate warmth. We need a monitor so that we can take care of vital signs as is oxygen saturation, ECG, respiration and measuring CO2 elimination. And of course we need some equipment to support the respiratory efforts of the children. That is a ventilator where we are able to tune the FeO2 we are able to support spontaneous breathing of the infants and also to ventilate synchronized with the ventilation of the babies. Of course, we have to be able to administer drugs. So we need an IV access, we need infusion pumps where we can administer important life-saving drugs. And last but not least, we need a whole system that offers the possibility of gentle transportation and that should be an adequate transportation system. And one of these systems could look like that, um, an, an incubator that uh, combines all these special devices to transport these infants in a safe way. But we have to deal with discomfort during transport and in the last year there has been conducted an investigation in 240 transport episodes where they um, did uh, infant pain profile during the transport and what we could see is that the patients before and after transport had a very low level of discomfort and during transport it was a, a really high level. Why is there discomfort for the babies during transport? One point is noise. And we know that noise levels above 45 decibels should be avoided. 
And we know also if loud noise persists, hearing loss can occur. And in transports, we measured levels around 99 decibels. Uh, and, and these noises were the loudest during air transports. The other point is vibrations. And they are uh, relevant, especially when we are transporting preterm infants. And these vibrations are a risk factor for intraventricular hemorrhage. So for the future, we should care of these things as well. We should care for noise reductions, for example, by noise dampening measures in the incubator and in the car. We could easily use earmuffs for the babies and we should reduce vibrations by use of air foam mattresses or also search buffer systems in the car. I think neonatal transport is definitely an, an evolving system. And I think many years ago we had uh, less specialty teams available. We would send uh, um, a physician or a paramedic out to the scene. And over the last years actually it's become clear that we need more and more specialized teams. Uh, Munich is actually one of the first uh, cities that had a neonatal transport system and they've had that for you know more than uh, 20 years now. Um, also the system that we take, uh, the, the equipment that we take is getting far more complex. The ventilators we use have more modes, we can now take inhaled nitric oxide, some ventilators on transport can provide high frequency ventilation and so I think the babies we transport are, have gotten much sicker over the years and so is the system and the, uh, the equipment that we have is more complex. There is still a long way to avoid that babies suffer or even die from transport. With a modern high-end technology and a good infrastructure, we are well on the way to offering these little patients a safe transport setting. <laughs>